For this particular video, we're going to focus on how to assess our model quality, or I guess do some what are called model diagnostics to make sure that the model that we're using isn't violating any assumptions uh, too badly, or hopefully it's kind of meeting the assumptions. So how do we do that? Well, first we have to kind of use a model of some type to test it against. So previously you all had created maybe model four, which we call model four. I'll recreate one, I'll call it model four. Um, and then it's a linear model and we were doing life expectancy 2017 squiggly line we had smokers and we also had plus a income for dot F factor variable so that that income for factor variable now here it says smokers isn't found because I used the wrong one. There it is, capital S. All right, we run it. Now, if I were to um, look at this model, I have to do summary, model four, make sure it did what I wanted it to do. It's all there. You can see the factor level variables expressed as F2, F3, and F4 see smokers expressed as a continuous variable f1 isn't shown that's the reference group and come for dot f1 that's the the out group that was the poorest group the one coded as one so we see our adjusted r square value now what are we going to do well there's a variety of different approaches that are out there but the most common approach and this is what's cool about our studio is it lets us do and I'm going to maybe before I do this plot, I'm going to make this a little larger so that we can see it more clearly. All right, plot model four. And it'll let us view one at a time. Hit return to see next plot. So here we have the residuals versus the fitted values. Now, these residual values um, kind of tell us like how far away from the fitted values these things have moved. And you can see that whatever number 302 is, it's moved a long way from our fitted line. But that's not the only intent here, isn't just to look for, you know, major outliers. The, the other intent is to see is the variability kind of scattered around zero evenly. Ideally, we want the residuals to kind of be up and down below this zero line evenly across the distribution. So that would, you know, illustrate heteroscedacity. Homoscedacity, which would mean that there could be some clumping or fanning, that would be problematic. So we have random movement of our or random residuals here so that's normal they call that like a stochastic randomness or something to that effect all right the residuals also follow a horizontal band you draw a line of best fit the red line is pretty close to zero so that's a good thing and for the most part there's no single residual that steps stands out if you do find some that stand out, they may be outliers. So we see 302, 68, and 304 are identified by our studio as outliers. So if we were to scroll down to 302 and see who it is, which here we have San Miguel County, Colorado, and if we were to go find its life expectancy, it's 97.96. I mean, these people are apparently living a really, really long life in that county and a lot longer than you would expect, possibly based upon um, their fitted values. So we would expect them to maybe have lived 79 or 78 years, I guess. Here's where the model is, but they are living almost 20 years longer than that or 17 years longer than that. So. We have 68 and 304. 304, I think, is another Colorado county. You can scroll over and look at their life expectancy. 
and we see they lived to 94.65 years. 68, who is that? You scroll down there, and you can see number 68. It's this uh, Aleutians East Borough, Alaska, which the life expectancy there is apparently 81. And based on their income and their smoking, they shouldn't be 81. Apparently they should be, you know, maybe lower than that. So if we get the right one, 68, yeah. Maybe it wasn't 81, 68. There it is, it's 92 years of age. So they shouldn't be living to 92 or 93 years of age as a county average based on the model. So what's going on there? They call that positive deviant research actually. Um, you could qualitatively study some of the factors happening in those areas. But for our purposes, for modeling, you know, how much tolerance do you have yourself for how to handle these, um, you know, these outliers. Some random outliers is okay, but if they're insanely different, or if they would really stick out alone, then you definitely would want to deal, deal with them. All right, it could mean that you need to have a better model, or it could mean that you had some error entering it, or something to that effect. But these aren't too terrible. All right, now, that's a little bit about the residuals versus the fitted. I'm gonna hit enter and we'll bring up the next plot. So I hit return, I wanna see the next plot. So let's see, there it is. The, well, it skipped them. I, I wanted to see that previous one. So we'll go back and do the normal one here in a little bit. So here's the scale versus location plot. Scale versus location plot. And for the scale location plot, there are a few things that we might be interested in looking at. One, how close is this to being a horizontal line? Is there any single one that sticks out? And overall, it seems pretty close to being a horizontal line. This is pretty similar to the previous graph we discussed. So if you see like a diagonal line or something or a line that's kind of this way and then it's sharp diagonal, those are problematic, but here, a horizontal line, a flat line is a, is a good thing. So we're doing okay with regards to that. All right, so the next plot, residuals versus leverage. Now, this is blocky because we've got these factor level variables in there. And uh, another uh, outlier has been kind of identified, but overall, they're with inside of Cook's distance. So there could be another line up here for Cook's distance above. Sometimes you'll see Cook's distance here and here. These numbers appear to be with inside. You know, I don't, I, I don't see a red dotted line above here. So all these numbers apparently are with inside of the Cook's distance band. So that's a good thing. All right, now I need to redo these plots because I need to see the normality plot again so you guys can look at it. I've hit enter, so hopefully it will come up. It was a little slower the last time. And if it just passes by and we see it, it's kind of stuck there. There it is, hopefully it don't go away, but pretty straight line overall. We'd like for them to be more on that dotted line, but this is a pretty decent fit. Um, this is getting a little concerning, but not as bad as um, many will, will see. And I'll share with you guys an example. Um, you know, this is bad. This is not normal. This is pretty close to what you'd wanna see. Um, ours is, probably closer to the case number one example there. So it's all right. If you want to assess the normality piece of it, you can, you could do, um, you know, you can actually uh, create residuals. We can call them, we can call it whatever we want. We'll call it res, res five or something, or this is model four, we'll call it res four. 
res4, and we make the little arrow, equals residuals of model 4. And that residuals is a command. So now it's actually went ahead and, and created a, a variable called res4 that's kind of running here in the background. And you can do a Shapiro test on res4 and see that there's the W value, it's 0 0.94. It's not like 0 0.99, we'd love for it to be that high to assume that the normal assumption is being clearly met by our model, but here we don't have the evidence to show that. All right, so maybe you wanna say, well, let's see if we can make our data better fit the normal distribution. Let's, uh, instead of using um, a categorical variable, maybe we can uh, try something else. So let's uh, make our model based off of the uh, log 10 income. And if you haven't created a log 10 income variable, I'll just call it log um, you know, income. There's one called log 10 income I've already created, but I'm gonna call this one log income. Log income equals log 10 comma household income. All right, now when we run our model, Instead of using the factor variable, I'm going to use this new variable we call log income. That one I just created. And we can do our plots on it. They'll look a little different now on our model four. I just created that model four. We can run our, we can make our plots. It'll present them. I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna sweep that thing clear. Hit to return plot. All right, plot model four, hit to return to see next plot. So there's our residuals versus fit. It look very similar to the last one that we did. So not much impact there. That normal plot looks very similar. So not much impact there. Horizontal line there. No uh, bow shapes or anything like that. Pretty good there. Now, Cook's distance has changed. We can actually see this dotted line here, but nowhere do we see any numbers above this dotted line, nor do we see it below the Cook's distance dotted line. So, you know, we're good there. Um, so that's all the different plots. If you want to, you know, map out our residuals, we can uh, create, you know, or recreate res4. Res4 equals residuals parentheses model four this is our new model four we run it it's created a new variable called res4 or it's replaced the old res4 with this now we can do a shapiro test on the res4 if you want and we see the w got worse so here is an example of where log transforming the income from the quartile approach made it worse and you could theoretically even replace log income with household income the one it was based upon and then uh, we can do the residuals for household income and do the Shapiro test on it and see it's 0.94 so they're all pretty similar to one another the log transformation of the income value in this case really didn't provide much benefit. So you'd probably just, you know, be comfortable running with, with whatever approach you want to use there. But no really major gross departures in this example. I'll provide a few um, websites, two websites, one from the University of Virginia um, that lets you, uh, you know, read a little bit on how to interpret these residuals versus fitted these normal QQ plots, scale versus location plots, residual versus leverage plot, as well as this one from Penn that uses some mini tab images from a stat program mini tab, but the same point, you can read about the residuals plots and read how to interpret them. Again, this is an art and science. There's no single right answer, you know, for interpreting these things. You're really looking for major departures from these things. And, and then if you have outliers, you may need to look at them to make sure that your model is, is working right, the data that went in there were correct. And, um, and then if they're really bad departures, you may have to exclude them, but you have to be very careful in how you do that. 
So that's just a little introduction uh, for the purpose of this class on letting you see how you can use our studio to assess these models. There's going to be another video that you're going to see here shortly that um, looks at multicollinearity. That's another thing we have to check um, to make sure everything is working well when we do our linear regression models. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to answer.